Hello guys, how are you? And welcome back to this week's episode of Ups and Downs for Star Trek Discovery. I am Sean Ferrick, which hopefully you've been following the season so far. Hopefully you've been enjoying the season so far. Hopefully you've been enjoying the different episodes that we've done. We're going to jump straight in today to the Ups and Downs for Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 3, People of Earth. We're going to run down really, really quickly through the plot of how the episode unfolds. I liked it. I'm going to say that I think this is a really solid episode. I think we've been a bit spoiled so far on how good Season 3 has actually been with Star Trek Discovery. And it does feel like a new show. All right, so that's actually that that's a positive. People were worried when we had the Klingon War of season 1, then we had the definite tone shift of season 2, and this seems to still be going on the up. So, positive news again, good episode this week, staying good. My first up of the episode is that reunion. So as you'll remember, at the end of last week's episode, that lovely parasitic ice, which is a little bit of a Marmite invention, was covering the hull of Discovery, and then it gets reefed out the ground by a tractor beam. Wouldn't you know it? It's Book and Burnham. Uh, although the Discovery crew don't know Book just yet. Tiny little backstory as to what Burnham's been doing for the last year. And it seems like she's been hanging out with Book. She's been... Uh, courier with him which is cool thanks to that we get to see a couple of easter eggs which I'll come back to later on but also we see her getting really really acclimatized to what's going on in this new time so we get through her we get the guide to the new time that we badly need so that reunion it's tearful it's actually a bit beautiful it got me right in the feels so yeah as I said that's my first up of the episode and it goes straight into my second up of the episode Captain Saru now look everyone knew this was coming and I don't mean that in any kind of bad way he deserves this and he's so humble about it he says he'll have a conversation with Burnham and she steps up and she says the words that I think are right it's you it's always been you how else do I put this it feels like a really Star Trek way of becoming a captain. We're away from the Federation. We're away from the pomp and the ceremony. This is, if you have to democratically pick your captain, this is how you would do it. So for me, up. Just as we kind of go into the opening credits as well, and there was a lovely thing in the opening credits that you probably know what I'm going to talk about, but I like that idea. I like that feeling of hope that is starting to radiate through this show. And that had been badly missing from the first year. I think we can agree that that sense of hope and happiness was just not there in season one. It was starting to come back in season two. Season three, it seems to have landed. It feels like, it feels like a breath of fresh air. And wouldn't you believe it, directed by Jonathan Frakes as well, who, I mean, Please don't tell me I need to tell you who Jonathan Frakes is. Obviously, he played Mr. Troy. The scene where Burnham reconnects with Tilly. Now, I got from that Battlestar Galactica, the memorial hallway. I love it. That's not a criticism at all. I really like that, that they're putting the, uh, as we know from the pilot from Battle of the Binary Stars, we know that each person's delta has their name on them. And I thought that was a really, really nice tribute. I'm okay with it being, if it is a deliberate nod to Battlestar Galactia, okay. If it's not a deliberate nod to Battlestar Galactia, okay. The reuniting between Burnham and Tilly is just one of those, again, nice scenes. It doesn't feel forced, it feels so natural. And the way that Sonequa Martin-Green and Mary Wiseman sell that scene, it's beautiful. It really is like two old friends, family coming back together again. And Tilly, maybe perhaps with the exception of Saru, she knows that Burnham has changed. She knows that she's gone through a lot in the last year. And of course she has. It doesn't mean it's all negative, but she has gone through a lot. And she instantly recognizes that. And that's what we're here for. Character development, character knowledge is why 
people react so well, I feel, to Star Trek as a whole because they've got believable characters. And particularly as shown in this scene and throughout the rest of the episode, Discovery seems to be finally settling into the fact that they've got great characters. Let's start using them. Cake is eternal. Up. David Ajala is back this week and he's just so, so good, which is such a kind of a soft compliment to give someone, but he's so good, he's so comfortable. They clearly have a fantastic, fantastic rapport going between the two of them. Burnham is very much his teacher in these scenes. She has been on Discovery. She knows Starfleet. He doesn't know anything of the sort, but he's also been her guide and her teacher to the modern time that they live in. It, it's, it's a really nice double act that they've got going here. And I really liked, I really liked the dilithium chamber scene. He's got this sense of awe and wonder, even though he's standing in a museum from his point of view, the audience, we're going, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense that you would keep a spare supply of dilithium somewhere. In fact, Saru is pretty fast and loose with the dilithium he's giving out. So obviously they're not really worried about how much they have which is really interesting because if you think about it in Next Generation and even Voyager, you, you don't really get a real idea of how much dilithium a ship carries. Whereas this, you, you get the bay, but that entire scene, Burnham and Book just coming together, getting to know the new ship, getting to know the old Burnham, it's a really, really, really nice scene. I really like that one. When they get then, very surprisingly, for how quickly it happens when they get to Earth. Yeah, kind of was it. Okay, yes, it's in the title of the episode. Yeah, but that could really stand for anything. Okay, it probably means people of Earth. Also, this scene references the fact that they have changed quadrants. Now, although Beta Quadrant doesn't get said by name in this episode, we know that Terralesium is in Beta Quadrant from last season. Now, we know that they weren't on Terralesium, but Burnham says that in the intervening year, she got in touch with Terralesium, 10 points for every time you say that word, and she was able to confirm, or well, not confirm, what happened to her mum. Nobody has heard of her there. She then, in the same vein of that conversation, says to Book, oh, now we're over in a different quadrant. It's unlikely that she was referring to Delta or Gamma with the sheer amount of Alpha Quadrant races that we've seen so far. So this is an episode that I reckon it's definitely Beta and Alpha. They get to Earth and they are warned almost straight away by the United Earth Defense Forces of the smuggler slash raider called Wen. I mean, a lot of jokes went through my head there. Um, when, where is when, when is when, what is when? How is when? And the entire planet is covered in a shield and the United Earth Defense Force, they beam on board with those personal transporters, which I'm really loving, by the way. I think they're really, really cool. And we get introduced to Adira. Now, it's a soft introduction. Adira is just one of the crew that beams on board to do their investigation. Adira beams into the spore drive bay. So Adira straight away is interacting with Tilly and Stamets. It's light so far. Obviously, the entire world has been told that Adira is joining the show. So what are they going to do? So far, we don't know. Saru is getting his first test as captain when, not intentional, when arrives in the raider ships. They're coming up. They can clearly overpower the Discovery, or can they? United Earth Defense Forces are not happy to see them. And then quantum torpedoes are ordered, fired at Wen's forces. Book and Burnham have jumped on Book's ship with the entire uh, inventory of dilithium. You remember when I said it was, a, it was a good idea to have spares of dilithium? Well, I, I probably should have mentioned that they took all of those spares and put them on Book's ship. Now it was for a good reason because if the United Earth Defense Forces had found them on the ship, there could have been trouble. And well, there is trouble because when wants that dilithium, that dilithium is then taken off the ship. It's being flown toward them. There's a bit of trouble here. Captain Saru echoing a little bit of Captain Pike in the Battle of Such Sweet Sorrow part two, 
puts Discovery in the path of those quantum torpedoes so that the ships can't get fired upon. Detmer doesn't seem to like this idea. Again, this week, it's not really played as strongly as last week, but keep an eye on Detmer. She's clearly traumatized. She's not okay. Oosakon, she notices it this week, big time, because she manages to say, shields are at full strength. You know, we can do this, but she's more saying it to Detmer than she is to Saru. Quantum torpedoes versus 23rd century tech. Discovery shields are gone like that. And it's still fairly impressive that they survived a single hit from a quantum torpedo, but they did, it's great. Technically, Detmer's kind of vindicated, but yeah, anyway, how and ever. Burnham and Book, on the other hand, they have got in touch with Wen, they have tricked Wen into lowering his shields, and Burnham rocks up with Wen in custody, brings him aboard Discovery. So this is all positive so far. Saru manages to convince United Earth Defense Forces and Wen to talk. Giorgio, who's looking well in an admiral's outfit, I will say, manages to rip this helmet off Wen. And who is it? It's Todd the Wraith. Sorry, that was for my Stargate fans out there. Christopher Heyerdahl, who has just been in everything. Uh, very, very welcome addition. Really, really like this guy. He's got just the raveliest voice. It's just fantastic. The man does not look well though, because he, along with the rest of the Belters, have been trying to get... Wrong show. He, along with the rest of the people on Titan, have been struggling to make ends meet while they consider, and are not entirely wrong, that Earth has been hoarding a lot of resources from them. Earth has been adopting a shoot first, ask questions later policy. The people from Titan have not responded very well to this and apparently have visited terrible, terrible raids on the people of Earth. It's not really explained in great detail, but it is a little bit of an issue because if Wen's people have created enough hassle for, for Earth's forces to want to blow them up straight away from the sky, they seem to talk very, very quickly. And it's good, don't get me wrong, loving the diplomacy, but it's all a bit easy, isn't it? And I'm sorry to say, even though it's a nice framing, I get to down. Oh, you never know, we might see more of that throughout this season. Uh, we obviously have an episode later on in the season called Unification 3, so uh, my money is still on that that involves Romulans and Vulcans in some way, but now we know that Earth is no longer part of the United Federation of Planets. Is that what the unification is? Is it bringing together Vulcan and or Tellar Earth? Who knows? But for now, because it was so quick, I'm giving that a down. There was one other little down, and this is gonna sound very nitpicky, but because we've been enjoying really, really good writing this season so far, it's been, it's been much stronger, I think, than a lot of Discovery than that's come by. There is one moment in this episode that falls into what I'm gonna call the Captain Riker and your Tal Shiar ass family of script writing. Burnham goes to find Book. Book is in the mess hall. Book is trying to get a buzz on. She then has to explain to him that Cynthia Hall won't get you drunk. And so Book laments the fact that he was trying to get a buzz on and just sit around in his existential dread and oh my god it's so forced. Down. Right back in with an up though. While Adira is doing their thing and Stamets twigs it pretty quickly that Adira has sabotaged some of the tech, stops all the United Earth Defense Force people from beaming off, they need to find out what's going on. So Tilly and Stamets, they back and forth over us. Tilly again, Mary Wiseman, you're deadly. Please keep doing you. They start to discuss tweens and teens. And I thought, okay, this is good, this is good. And then Stamets goes, oh, how would I get a tween to talk? And <laughs> Tilly goes, I don't know, like any other teen. Give him some of your mushrooms. Stamets looks at her deadpan and just goes, who are you? Up. I loved that scene. I thought it was so funny and I'm loving the way their relationship is growing together. Really, really enjoyed that now. That really was an up from me. One, one I suppose, question slash concern I had was, Stamets tells Adira 
after they have sort of outed Adira, if you like, tells Adira when they're from. And again, this is a little bit confusing. This is kind of one of my issues with last week. So Saru really didn't want anyone to know when they're from. And they make a whole spiel about that at the start of this episode of like, let's not tell people when we're from. Ah. Direct quote. And Stamets just tells Adira on the spot. I suppose that could be forgiven because, you know, any tricorder is going to pick up the fact that this material is from 23rd well, as they say, between 23rd and 25th century, Saru tried to make them believe that it was actually like a generational ship. Stamos tells, uh, tells Adira it was time travel. I don't know. It's neither an up or a down. It was just an odd choice, I felt, in that moment. The reveal of Adira as a blended human with a trill symbiont, um, I'm really on board with that. I think that's a really, really good idea. Obviously, we know the Trill are going to come back into this in quite a strong way. And of course, Trill, long living, totally fine. Cool, we'll get our history lessons. However, and this is a down from me, Adira very conveniently is having trouble accessing the memories of the symbiont. Now, yes, TNG's the host said that there can be issues with a human and a trill symbiont that's totally fine but Riker was able to access Odan's memories no problem it just seems a little bit the plot requires them to not know what the memories are and it was just a little bit heavy-handed it's a down but we'll forgive them going forward it's a nice down Chris do we have an icon for a nice down Balls in your court. Final scene of the episode, while it's it's really, really nice to see Earth. I use that word way too much. It's nice to see Earth. It's nice for this. It's nice for that. Everything's nice. I have a rapid succession of down and up here, okay? Down. The Golden Gate Bridge has not changed from this shot back to the 24th century for when Picard went to San Francisco to the 23rd century before it when they're doing the final scene where Enterprise has gone back to Earth. It's just, <clears throat> I love the Golden Gate Bridge and have always loved the Golden Gate Bridge because of Star Trek. But it's the exact same shot. I'm not saying it's, you know, they didn't render a new one, but it kind of looks like they didn't render a new one. It kind of feels like something sort of changed there. So that's a down, but coming back with a wrap it up. Here's the up. I love that final scene in the park. Tilly runs toward the tree. I love it. And sit down because this one's a shocker. Reese, Bryce, and Nilsson all get a line of dialogue. I know, I know, I wasn't ready for it either. It's great. It's nice that the crew gets to speak. And there was a few quieter moments in this episode as well. I am really, really feeling positive this week about where Discovery is bringing the show, the crew, the characters. I am totally fine with, if that's the last we see of Earth, I don't think it will be, but if that is the last we see of Earth, then I like what they did with it. So for me, that final scene was an up. Now, the fantastic Paul Sutherland has managed to send me the Easter eggs for this episode because Frankly, I wanted a day off, so Paul, you've done me a solid. But there was quite a few in this episode. We had, to begin, the Dot 7 robots, which we previously only seen around Enterprise, are seen repairing Discovery at the beginning of this episode, obviously from their impact through the asteroid. Also, whatever Discovery is made out of, build your planes and cars out of that, because that stuff can take a beating. In one of the flashbacks to when Michael's a courier, we see her getting a... a a strip of tech and it has NCC 4774 47 reference love it also in that very same scene we've got Cardassians now I know we've seen Andorians already in this season so maybe that's not so much of an easter egg but Cardassian front of the frame love it easter egg yes but it's kind of called out in dialogue but Terralesium what's going on with her mum they wouldn't have dropped that in if we're not going to get some sort of answer later on will it be anything to do with the burn Comment section suggests it might be. The United Earth Defense Forces insignia 
it's designed almost exactly the way the Star Trek galaxy is divided between Alpha, Beta, Gamma and Delta quadrants. And speaking of the United Earth Defence Forces, United Earth was the name of the government that existed before the Federation in Enterprise, but it seems to have expanded this time obviously to include Tellarites and some other races as well. We get called into quadrants like we said before, we get to see all of the dilithium that's going on in that ship in that storage bay. Quantum torpedoes. I was so excited. <laughs> Burnham says that she had heard of the Trill but didn't know they were a joint species. That tracks. In The Host we, we met the Trill but we find out in the course of the episode that they are a blended species because Odan has to tell Dr. Crusher about that. So that actually tracks. And there you have it for this week. If there's anything I missed, please make sure to drop it in the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel. You can find us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can find myself on Twitter at Trek Culture as well. I'm on all the various social medias. Please tune in next week again. Have a fantastic week and as always, live long and prosper.